this shifting back now really, it's a shorter session, shifting back now to sharing some kind of personal experience of mine. And um, I spoke about it to begin with, and a couple of you have asked me about it outside, is you know, where do you get your support from as a social entrepreneur? And it was my, my dad has always said this ever since I was about six, because he was trying to educate me as a businessman when I was six. You know, it's not what you know, it's who you know at any time, good or bad, it's who you know. And he's always encouraged me to be a networker, but it's actually only in the last four or five years that I've added any structure to that. And um, Marco in the audience here has, I've not known him very long, but what I will always remember him for and value him for already is Marco is what you will find is a connector. He's extremely affable and easy to get along with. And then he shares those relationships very easily. And he can clearly listen because he always introduces you with some detail. And it's really impressive to see. If he does it naturally, it's a gift. If he's doing it on purpose, it's a real asset. And you need to find other people who can do that for you, connecting people. And ideally, if you can do that a bit yourselves, that's a really good lesson to be. And it's great feedback to get from someone when they say thank you for the connections that you've made, because you know you've done something of worthwhile to them. But that's, that's one of the things I learned, was the, the connectors are worth their weight in gold. They make it so much more easy. You know, so for example, I'm trying to build a coalition behind uh, the organization that I'm going to try and build. And Marco has probably introduced me to at least five of the people that I know in a group of about 12 I need to meet in a, in a few weeks. I know it's a small place, but without Marco, that would be how many hours worth of internet research? How many hours of finding somebody on LinkedIn and writing to them and making a case for why they should meet you? So networking has become a really, really important part of my life. Um, it's something that I'm regarded for. You know, people have said, you're a connector. How, who did you, how did you meet this person? I met them through Richard. Um, they've actually um, gave me good feedback about, you know, that it's, it's always fun. You're always getting drunk or we're always going out for meals or it's always social, you know, where there's always something to remember. So I've actually realized that networking is, is a very fun activity. Um, but to begin with, I hated networking because I thought it was what so many people think it is, which is going to events and then going out for a coffee when all you really want is a coffee and either receiving someone's business card or going up to someone and giving them your business card or trying to get a conversation going when actually you might not be in the mood. But actually, that's really poor networking. And the reason why we think it's networking is because people that organize these events put it on the agenda, 15 minutes of networking. But you'll find in your career that 15 minutes is enough time to really get into a conversation with someone, and then they go and say, come back into the room. And all you want to do is continue to chat at the back, you know, like you're back at school. So when that started to happen to me, and I was going to all these things, and I, started, I didn't enjoy the networking, I took some advice from a mentor who actually has taught me everything I know about taking a far more structured approach to networking, which actually reminded me much more of my sales training and actually building up a customer base over time, which was all about learning about what the customer and using that information and developing a relationship with them. So actually, networking and customer development are extremely similar. And the network for me, has been really important. So I wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for my networking activity. So I am earning money from my networking activity, that's true. I wouldn't have had beers last night in my new home if it wasn't for my networking activity. I wouldn't have been able to see that there were opportunities in Cyprus and in this region if it wasn't for my diverse networking activity. Are you wanting to network with people who were not like me? And I wouldn't have actually had the encouragement inside myself to actually make the leap 
leave a very well paid job and the security of that to start doing the things that I wanted to do. You know, I'd been a CEO, I'd been a senior management, I'd been managing teams, but I actually wanted to take the biggest risk of my life. And I felt able to do that because I felt that there was some kind of network net. That even if I did fall and, and hit my knees, that I would have people to call, that there would be people that I could rely on, that I could, and I could talk to them before that. And I'll tell you something that happened to me when I became a CEO, which was in 2005. I thought the organisation was very rich. I'd been led to believe it had a lot of money in the bank and I had a big plan as to what we were going to do with this money. But actually I realised the organisation was very poor. I hadn't done my homework at all. And when, I was, when it was announced that I had got the job and everyone else thought the organisation had money, lots of people wanted to work with me because they had ideas about how I should spend the money as well. And I was like really popular for about a week. As soon as they found out that actually that wasn't the case, they just evaporated. And I hadn't done any structured networking activity to that point. So I literally had no one to talk to. There was nobody that I could actually pick up the phone and say, I think I've made the worst mistake of my life. And about three or four people rang me instead because they were good networkers and they'd identified that I was somebody that, and they'd done all the building of a relationship. I didn't feel I could call them, but they reached out and called me. And that was the last time I ever left it to that sort of chance. Very grateful to those people, four awesome people who did it very quietly and were absolutely essential. And we turned that organization around and I was very happy with what happened. But it was a real wake up call. You know, and there wasn't much point calling my parents. <laughs> it, was just, it was just kind of like, yeah, I've grown up now, I can't just... I did ring my father, actually, but didn't get the response I needed. So I took ownership then of building a network. So I have made money out of networks, but I've realised that's not the point. The point is relationships, because they are an amazing resource in that box. In my, if I was a business model that box would have my network in it. You know? And the tools that are available today for networking. I mean, LinkedIn is the kind of obvious one. But I didn't use LinkedIn at all about two or three years ago. But then when I started to travel abroad and meet other people, I started to think, where am I going to keep all these contacts? How am I going to keep in touch with these people? How am I going to learn from them? And I started to build it. But it was only when I did it in a structured way did I start to actually really build it and then get feedback, change that, that doesn't make sense. You should be pushing more of that about you. Here's a recommendation, let me recommend you. You know, using the job title of someone else to actually give you credibility. Enormously powerful tool, LinkedIn. Really powerful tool, especially in this global world. Fantastic business model as well, all based on freemium. You're getting all that service for free for those annoying recruitment consultants that pay for the monthly membership. Ha, 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 ha. Okay? So this session is about how will you build as a social entrepreneur, as an entrepreneur, as a global citizen, a high-impact network. High-impact <coughs> networks. So the opposite of being networked, which is what I learned, was loneliness. You will be isolated as a social entrepreneur or an entrepreneur regularly. Even if you're running a multi-million pound organisation, there will be times when you are the only person that understands what you're talking about, the only person that can see an opportunity, the only person in the room with you. It can be an isolating job. Having a high impact network stops it being lonely. Lonely is a depressing position. Isolated is just something different. But a high impact network stops you being lonely. It's all about connecting. Reaching out and touching other people. Entrepreneurs are connectors. If you do not like spending time with people who are not like you, 
don't become an entrepreneur. You'll find it really difficult. You'll end up lonely. If you do enjoy connecting with other people, being an entrepreneur is one of the most exciting things I think that, that you can have because you will spend a lot of your time connecting with people. This is a six-month-old map of my network. Crazy little tool on LinkedIn. It's, it's quite ironic, actually, because that looks like a part of the United Kingdom where I lived. So it's almost like coterminous with this green area, that bit of the United Kingdom that sticks out, and blue being London. But you can see that about a year or two ago, I started to really branch out. And this group over here is Cyprus and the Middle East. And you can find the connectors. I could find Marco there and I could zoom in and it would show you all the people he'd connected me to or, I'd, or we were sharing common with. You get these people that emerge as just super connected people. And it's changed again since then because I am trying to diversify myself away from my kind of core network, which was the blue is actually the United Kingdom social enterprise sector. That's 10 years worth of hard work of getting to know people in that sector, who, as you can see, also have been working hard to get to know each other. That was a big learning point for me. I thought, wow, I know lots of people, but they also know each other. Green was almost one organization, a massive organization. <clears throat> and I was regarded in that organization as being one of those people that really knew nearly everybody, and they knew me, or they'd heard of me of the active networking approach I took, which was not very cultural. But also, they only know each other. It was a very isolated organization, very, very cut off. And this sort of purpley red area around the edge, if you look at that, that's me connecting them to this wider world. That was my job for four years, was to actually connect them to the real world, business people, financiers, investors. So it's interesting to map your network in the same way as you would map your business model. Have a think about who you know, how you know them, and how what you want to know them, how you're going to develop a relationship. And there are workbooks that have been designed to go with these talks, and there are tools and things that you can use to actually do that. So another colleague of mine, who I've been meeting now for about uh, three and a half years, and trying to build a relationship with him, runs a, an organization in London, very clever guy, used to be a banker, a big investment house, now doing something completely different. We were having a conversation about networking just the other day, and, and he thinks it's a bit like this. Networkers are chess players, poker players, roulette players, or they play snap. I think I'm a chess player. I think I've got skill, but I've got no luck. Nobody rings me and says, here's a £50,000 contract. But I try very hard to meet those people in a skillful way. You will meet people when you network who are very skilled and they're also really lucky. It's as though they've got their Midas touch. They shake a few hands and the business rolls in and they've always got a smile on their face. You could hope to be this you know, poker player. Quite a lot of people are roulette players. They rely on luck. They rely on the Marcos to introduce them to people. And they just don't think there's any skill involved. They go to the opening of an envelope, as we say. There's no structure to it. They're the not workers. They're the ones that devalue networking. And the low skill, low look, you know, the, you're the snap players. And it's amazing how many people I've met in my career who have very senior positions who have those strategies for networking. I don't have time for networking. I don't have time for strategy. I'm a busy CEO. Then watch what happens when their business hits the rocks. They're in exactly the same position that I was. You know, they get fired, they have no one to call. Who are you going to call, as the film says? So think about where you want to be as a networker. And this is the approach. It's not about the money. It's about developing your ability to have a really good conversation. Because they build relationships. Then you might ask for something. Or that person might ask you for something. 
If you keep this in the focus of the heart of your networking, you will grow the type of network that will be worth something. Do people have heard people heard the phrase social capital? The connections that people have with each other are worth something. Well, actually, I think it's about social value. You know, the fact that I have good relationships with people means that at some point I might capitalize them. But I don't have relationships with people for what they can give me. I have them because it's the right thing to do as an entrepreneur. I might need them, or they might need me. Conversations first to build relationships, and then you might transact with people. This is science, which is that there's a limit to how many people you can have a stable, deep relationship with. If you're one of those popular people, that's great. But you can't have a genuine relationship with everybody. So your network, those first five to 15 people are the only ones that you can absolutely rely on. They're the ones that you will call if it all goes wrong. You must nurture those relationships. Because let's face it, if they're not there for you, you're going to need them. <coughs> but I do have a large number of people on my LinkedIn network, for example, but I would admit that there's only still that number of people that I actually have a relationship with. I know a lot more, and there's no one in my network that just comes up and says, I just want to be part of you because I'm building up my numbers. It's not Facebook. There has to be structure to it. But also, I have to be careful. I do remove people. I always make effort to have a Skype call with people as often as possible. If it is a new person and they've been recommended to me, at least let's have a conversation. Let's get the ball rolling. You must take real ownership of this because it's just impossible as a human to maintain really deep relationships with millions of people. So as an entrepreneur, who are your 5 and 15 and 25 people around you? And as an entrepreneur, you've got to think about how you balance them being there for you and being there for the business. You've got to sacrifice a bit of that number so that some are for the business. And at the moment, actually, my main focus is on building the network for the business. I'm sacrificing the time that I spend with friends, the time that I spend with other people, because they know, they have to accept, the business needs a network, and I have to build it. Some more rules, OK? You must focus on the quality of your shared activity. 15 minutes over coffee is not a shared activity, which is quality. Go out for dinner, have beers, share jokes, have fun, enjoy networking. If the quality of your shared activity together is a, is a good one, you will remember each other. You will be able to cope with not seeing each other for a while. You will be developing a meaningful relationship. Those that come over and just ram a business card into your, into your hand, there's no quality there. The shared activity is incidental. So those 15 to 25, make sure you're spending good quality time with them. Those people you know are not going to be part of your close network, but you really want a good relationship with them, do quality things with them. This might cost you some money, but it's an investment. But people that make quality time for me, and we talked about time before, it's not just about being on time, it's about quality of time, enjoying the time together, really important. That's been a really good one for me. If you can create the right atmosphere, you get deeper with people much quicker. Relationship versus transactional, which just means I just want to develop a relationship with you. I want to ask you questions. I want to find out about you. I'm not here to sell you anything, but it's off. And I can almost guarantee that that will get you more business. I did a, some business in Turin recently from someone I just had some good conversations with and that was enough for them to remember who I was, for them to pick up the phone and say, there's a piece of work here. You know, if you're too close to someone, if you and I are working together in the same field, same job, same industry, and you see an opportunity, why would you send it to me? It's relevant to you. You'd follow it yourself. But we hardly know each other. And if I knew there was something going on around human rights development workers, for example, in Africa for six months, I'd know you enough to send that to you. That's no skin off my nose. So actually, the distance we have can be useful. 
because I'm not going to share it with someone that I could benefit from the same thing. Valuable difference. It, that difference is valuable. Make sure your network has got different people in it. Very different people. You'll be surprised at how that diversity rewards you. If your industry is going down and you've only got a network in your industry, you'll all be bloody depressed. And when you say, who's got ideas? You'll be like, shut up with the ideas. None of us have got ideas. But if you've got diversity and you go and ask a banker about the arts community or the arts community about the banking, you might get a fresh idea, you might get a fresh lead. You know, if you are looking for a job, for example, you might be really reluctant to say, I need to find work to people that you've been working with for the past 15 years. But if you've got a network where you can say, I'm looking for a job, and people hardly know you, but they know what you do and what you're good at, you might get leads from people, oh, there's a job coming up in America. I'm pleased that I, that I know you're looking. I can put you in touch. The diversity is really valuable. And a lot of people, when you map your own network, you should see whether actually there's any diversity there at all or whether it's just really people like you. That's not networking. Perspective hopping. By this I mean that you should be constantly hopping into the shoes of the people you're networking with. It's about them, not about you. If you find out loads about them, you will find having conversations easier, which will mean you'll be able to create better quality shared activity. So it's about stepping into the shoes of other people, even when you're not with them. Would Marco like to read this? I wouldn't, but I know Marco's into that sort of thing. I'll send him that. How would Stefanos, how would Stefanos respond in this situation? Now I'm going to ring him and see whether that's how he would really respond. But even in the conversation, how do you perspective hop? Ask questions of the other person. And then pool maintenance, the pool being your network. How hot is it? How close are the relationships? How distant are they? How much time are you spending with people? Are you spending time with the right people? The depth and the width, the diversity, the seniority of people. Maintain it. Map it every so often. Look in your diary over the last six months. Who did you spend the most time with? How happy are you with the influence those people have over you? If you're not happy, don't spend the same amount of time with them for the next six months. As an entrepreneur, that's a really difficult decision to make because it will involve you spending less time with some of your friends. Because you're spending tons of time with them, but are they helping you with the business? Probably not. So actually you're going to have to step back from them and say, sorry guys, I'm not coming out with you for a drink three times a week, just once a week, because I need to be spending two days a week with some other people I need to get to know. And that is not the end. So this is about the technique. Search people out, communicate with them, educate them. Don't tell them, educate them. Social, connect, entertain. Be social, constantly be connecting, try and entertain people. No one next work with next work with boring people. That's the behaviour. Think about the content of your conversations. Think about how much you're putting into your network, and engage people. They're all interconnected. If you search people out, then you're being social, and you'll generate content, which will allow you to contribute and engage. If you're communicating, then you're connecting, and then you've got an opportunity to contribute. If you're educating, you're probably entertaining, not boring, and therefore you're engaging people. And that makes you a ninja of networking. Get your technique right, behave the right way, do it all together, and networking is a business practice, a business tool, but it's also very, very important for you as an individual. That really was the end. That is high impact networks.